Good morning and welcome again to Greenfield in the Diaspora. Today we're celebrating Holy Communion, so in case you haven't already done so, you can run and get a, a morsel of bread or um, some wine or juice so that you can take part in the feast because you are invited. Whoever you are and wherever you have been, you are welcome at his table. We're gathered, of course, in trying times, times of illness and of isolation, times of conflict and uncertainty. In these times, perhaps more important than ever to remind each other that God is Lord of all, that his steadfast love knows no bounds. Standing at the foot of the cross, we are reminded that though we live in this Good Friday kind of world, Easter is coming. The worst things are never the last things. And so, even in these trying times, as God's children, we sing hallelujah. The psalmist reminds us the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who live in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Let's worship God. Thank you. 
The scripture for this morning is from Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 19, and it's the parable of the wicked tenants. Please listen for the word of the Lord. He began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants and went to another country for a long time. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants in order that they might give him his share of the produce of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Next he sent another slave. That one also they beat and insulted and sent away empty-handed. And he sent still a third. This one also they wounded and threw out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Heaven forbid. But he looked at them and said, What then does this text mean? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the scribes and chief priests realized that he had told this parable against them, They wanted to lay hands on him at that very hour, but they feared the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Nancy. In the name of the Father and the Son and God's Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Well, we are thinking together this summer about some of Jesus' wonderful stories. And this morning, one of his lesser known stories, um, the parable of the wicked tenants, which Nancy has just read for us, and which is fine as long as you hear it the way Jesus tells it, that is, from the vantage point of the landowner. But this morning, I want to invite you to hear it Uh, from a different vantage point. I want to invite you to switch chairs for a few moments. So listen to another parable. Once upon a time, there was a rich businessman from Ohio who bought a derelict little orchard in Romeo, Michigan, of course. He pruned the trees. He fertilized them. He fixed up the sales shed He put a brand new hand-painted sign out on the road. Then he leased the place to a local family of modest means uh, for far less than market value with the understanding that he would receive 10% of the apples at the harvest. With little or no business experience, but high hopes of owning their own place someday, the new tenants agreed, and they sealed the deal with a handshake. Then the rich landowner got back in his Lincoln Town car, and he drove back to Columbus, and wasn't seen very much in Romeo for a long time. The tenants loved the place as if it were their own. They would get up at dawn and tend to the trees. They worked till dusk. They used only organic pesticides. They hauled water, sometimes by hand, during the summer drought. And when the first frost was predicted before the apples were right, they built small fires throughout the orchard and they stoked them all night long so that the trees stayed warm under a blanket of warm smoke. 
Come October, the air reeked of applesauce. Every time the tenants took a breath, their mouth watered. Meanwhile, the trees were so heavy laden with fruit, they looked like emerald ladies with too much jewelry on. It came time for the harvest, and they knew it had to be done quickly. So the tenants worked in shifts, half of them sleeping while the other half picked. Within 72 hours, it was all done, and mountains of apples rose from the wooden bins in the sales shed. There were Goldens and Max and Jonathans and Big Reds and... Happily exhausted, the tenants were just standing, admiring the fruits of their labor, when all of a sudden they heard gravel crunching under tires. They turned around to see a 16-wheeler with Buckeye logos on either side backing into this shed. Two big guys with bulging tattoo biceps got out and started loading some of the best apples into the truck without even introducing themselves. And when one of the tenants went over to negotiate this 10% business, one of those big guys just picked him up and gently put him off to the side. So the rest of the tenants held a quick huddle, and they decided to introduce these truckers to the Michigan farm version of People's Court. One of them cranked up the bobcat. The other got hold of some pitchforks and pruning hooks. And before long, they had persuaded the landowner's truckers to get back on 75 South empty-handed. Get lost, they told them, and the big guys did exactly as they were told. And you know as well as I do that what the tenants did was wrong. It was not their orchard. They had made a deal. The owner deserved his share of the produce. Still, there is something in this story that doesn't sit right. Maybe it's just the casual mention of slavery that seems to be taken for granted and which we're a little more sensitive to these days. Or maybe it's just because of the bad rap reputation of absentee landlords. Or maybe some of us have had parents or grandparents who were sharecroppers themselves. We know what a hard life this really is, tending to somebody else's land, bringing in somebody else's harvest, making somebody else's profits. It's just not the American way. From the beginning, our country has fueled the dreams of disenfranchised people from all over the world who have come here looking for a small piece of paradise. Some of you may have had ancestors who came from the old country, who crossed the ocean, worked hard to make their dreams come true. This is the American way. To own your own home on your own land, to preferably grow your own vegetables that can be put on your own family dining room table. None of this always having to look over your shoulder, handing your profit over to somebody else stuff. Most of us believe in ownership. We believe in autonomy, in self-reliance. Whether or not we can pull that off, those are the values that we have been raised on. Those are the values we strive to live by. But if Jesus' parable is to be believed, those are not the values of the kingdom. Ownership of the vineyard is not an option. It's not for sale. Never was, never will be. The owner isn't looking for buyers. He's looking for tenants who will give him his share of the produce at harvest time. Which means that the real issue in this story is that of stewardship a word that almost immediately puts us on a defensive because it messes with our sense of ownership. And it's not just the way we think of our things, um, my car, in my garage, in my house. It's really 
a whole mindset. It's the way we think about life. So a kid graduates from high school, one of the first things they'll hear at the graduation party is, so what are you going to do with your life? Which, of course, is a very different question from, what do you think God might have in store for you next? We have an ongoing debate in our culture about the right to life, the right to die. But show me one place in the Bible where it ever talks about life as a right. No, consistently the scripture talks about life as a gift of God. It's not my possession to do what I want to with. Your life, my life, is a gift from God. God. So we are not the self-made, do-it-yourself men and women that we often like to think ourselves to be. No, the Bible says that we are owned, that we were bought with a price. How often I hear pastors speaking with this kind of mindset. They talk about, this is my church, this is my session. How often I have heard you refer to this as Peter's church and how tempting that is as a pastor or as laity to buy into that illusion when at a better level we know that Presbyterian polity is based on a balance between clergy and laity. Several years ago, Will Williman, wonderful Methodist bishop down south, wrote a book on clergy burnout He interviewed some counselors who had worked with clergy who along the way had called it quits. And Will said one of the things that surprised him was that one of the counselors said that burnout is not primarily a psychological problem. It's not about needing to take another day off. It's not about looking after your physical well-being or your psychic needs. He said, It's a theological issue above all. It's about an unwillingness to let God be God in the church. And that is not just a clergy issue. That's something that affects us all. How tempting in our contemporary way of thinking to think of the church as my church, which incidentally is here to meet my needs. So on Sunday morning, man walking out of church thinks to himself, that sermon just didn't do anything for me. When, if we're following the parable, perhaps the better question would be to ask, what did the worship service do for the Lord? Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher, uh, had an image that he called the theater of worship. He says that, you know, normally you go to a theater, you sit there as part of the audience, and you expect to be entertained by the actors and the actresses up on the stage. And how tempting to think of worship in that way. But he said, in reality, in the theater of worship, the only audience is God. We are all up on the stage. All of our singing, all of our prayers, all of our listening is part of that worship. And when you begin to think that way, it can transform the way you think about worship. So maybe there is a note of grace in this parable. You and I, all by ourselves, cannot make church happen. Talented as the musicians may be, and as hard as I may work at making this sermon interesting and creative for you, And as committed as you are to helping to keep us all together during this pandemic and helping us work through this pastoral transition, for all of that, this is still God's church, in God's vineyard, in God's kingdom. So the psalmist says, if the Lord does not build the house, in vain do the builders labor. So there is a note of grace here. There is, however, also a note of judgment, right? The story does end with a threat, a threat that the vineyard could be taken away and given to others if we make enough of a mess of it. 
if we behave as though all of this is ours alone, we could lose it. Over the decades, the North American church has sent missionaries all over the world to South America, to Africa, to Korea. I mean, one of the reasons there is such a vital Presbyterian Korean church right here in Southfield is because decades ago, Presbyterians sent missionaries to Korea. And yet the irony, of course, in all of this is that in North America, the church is steadily declining, every denomination, while in all of these other parts of the world, it is growing leaps and bounds. It is actually possible that within our lifetime, certainly within our children's lifetime, there could be African missionaries sent to North America, just as there are Korean missionaries that today are sent to Russia. With every denomination in North America and Europe in a state of decline, could it be that the vineyard is being taken away from us and given to someone else? This almost sacred sense of ownership that colors literally every part of our lives. These are my kids in my house. This is my church. I did it my way, Sinatra sang. Our ancestors, you see, became defined tenants so long ago that most of us have forgotten the terms of the agreement. Somewhere along the way, we, we misplaced that ten tenants agreement and we wrote up a deed instead. The landowner um, spent most of his time in another county after all, and so it was so easy to forget him. When he sent messengers to remind the tenants of the agreement, it didn't take much to, um, to put them in their place and to send them back empty-handed. The owner probably could have had armed police officers or recruited his own gang of thugs. He could have returned violence for violence. But he didn't. Instead, he just kept sending messengers, one after the other, each of them pleading with the tenants to remember, to honor the original agreement. Finally, when there was a whole row of unmarked graves outside of the vineyard just filled with these messengers, the owner sent his only son, unaccompanied, unarmed, to teach the tenants what they had so clearly forgotten. He reminded them that ownership was just a game that they were playing. Like a 16-year-old who was given the keys to the car one night, and who thinks it's his own, but he doesn't even pay the insurance on it. The son reminded them that they were guests on this earth, not rulers, and that there was good news in that because being guests relieved them of certain responsibilities that, in all honesty, they were just not equipped to handle. He reminded them that being guests put them in a certain relationship with the host, who in turn put them in a certain relationship with one another. And once they got over this delusion of ownership, those relationships could be based on gratitude rather than incessant competition so that everything necessary for life could be shared. There would no longer be too little for too many and some who had way more than they needed. The growing gap between haves and have-nots would be seen for what it really is, a heresy. He reminded them that as guests, they were free to access far more than they could ever have earned on their own. Instead of a vineyard filled with these one-acre plots divided by barbed wire, they had access to acres and acres at their disposal, sort of like the national parks. Not something to own, but to use and enjoy because of the generosity of the owner. All he asked was that they take care of it, the earth, that they give back a portion 
of what had been provided for them. Not because he needed it, he would just give it right back to them, but because they needed it. They needed to give in order to remember who they really were. Grateful guests who took their lives into their hands like a wrapped and ribboned gift and who returned the favor by giving themselves away to others. He reminded them of all these things. And of course, the tenants killed the son as well. But he would not stay dead. And to this day, he still haunts the vineyard, reminding us that we are God's guests, that we are welcome on this earth so long as we remember whose it is and why we were here and how it is to be used. We can still love it as if it were our own. We can water it by hand. We can build fires against the cold frost. We can take delight in the harvest. We can even will pieces of it to our children, naming them as our successors, but always in the stewardship of God's vineyard. All we may not do is forget who the real owner is and why we were put here, because to do that is to court our own destruction. This land is not your land. This land is not my land, whatever Peter, Paul, and Mary may have thought, not ultimately, anyway. We are stewards. We are God's sharecroppers. And we are expected to be as generous with each other as God is with us, but we are never owners. It may not be the American way, but it's the kingdom's way. And I'll tell you something. The harvest, it'll take your breath away. Amen. Back in 1969, uh, the Beatles were going through some really tough times. George Harrison uh, had been writing a lot of his own music, but he just wasn't getting the same play as his cohorts, Paul and John. To make matters worse, uh, the meetings at their recording studio had increasingly become these long, drawn-out business affairs. So one morning, George decided to skip the meeting. He went instead to visit his friend, Eric Clapton, at his house some 20 miles away. And it was there, in Clapton's garden, that the seeds to... Here comes the sun were sown. George's answer to a much too long British winter. In fact, when the song was actually recorded, John was not present. He was still recovering from a serious car accident. So in many ways, George's classic song is a reminder to us that even in these trying days, there is reason for hope. Here's Jim White singing, Here Comes the Sun. Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun, and I say, it's alright Little darling It's been a long Cold lonely winter Little darling It seems like Years since it's been here Just Here comes the sun Smiles returning to the faces 
little darling It seems like years since it's been here Here comes the sun Here comes the sun And I say it's alright Sun, 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 here it comes. 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 Little darling, I feel that ice is slowly melting. Little darling, it seems like years since it's been here. Here comes the sun, here comes the sun, and I say it's all right. Here comes the sun Here comes the sun And I say It's alright This is the Lord's table Our Savior invites all those who trust and believe in him to come and share the feast that he has prepared this day. You are invited to come, not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Not because any goodness of your own gives you a right, but because you desire mercy. Come, because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. But above all, come because he loves you, because he gave his life for you. The Apostle Paul has written that the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. When he had offered thanks, he broke it and gave it to his friends. Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This cup, he said, is the new covenant shed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. We gather from east, west, north, and south to sit at table in his kingdom. Let us pray. Gratitude and praise, hearts lifted high, voices full and joyful, these you deserve. For when we were nothing, you made us something. When we had no name, no faith, no future, you called us your children. When we lost our way or turned away, you never abandoned us. When we came back to you, your arms opened wide in welcome. And look, you prepare a table for us offering not just bread, not just wine, but your very self, so that we may be filled, forgiven, healed, and blessed. You are worth all of our pain and all of our praise. So now, in gratitude, we join our voices with your children on earth and in heaven. Loving God, as we come to share the richness of your table, 
We cannot forget the rawness of this earth. We cannot take bread and forget those who are hungry. We cannot take wine and forget those who are thirsty. We cannot hear your words of peace and forget a world in conflict and war. We cannot celebrate the feast of your family and forget our own divisions. We are one in spirit, but not in fact. History and hurt still dismember us. For us, you were born. For us, you healed and preached and taught and showed us the way to heaven. For us, you were crucified, and for us, after death, you rose again. For all that you have done and all that you have promised, what have we to offer? Our hands are empty. Our hearts are sometimes full of all the wrong things. We are not fit to gather up the crumbs from under your table. But with you is mercy and the power to change us. So as we do what you once did in an upstairs room, send your Holy Spirit upon us, upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may become for us your body, and that we in turn may become your body in this world, loving and caring for all those whom you love. Loving God, now gather all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken. Gather them into the one prayer that you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to commune as we commune here. Nancy, the body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Peter, the body of Christ, broken for you. Amen. And the blood of Christ broken or shed for you. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray. Loving God, for this time, for this table, for these people with whom we share this moment. For all of this, we give you thanks and praise. Encourage us, enable us to be there for each other, empower us to be there for others. Use us as we go forth from this table. In Jesus' name, amen. Our concluding hymn, the trees of the field, and you may clap your hands. You shall go out with joy and be reborn with peace.
Go out into the world in peace. Live as free men and women. Serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of God's Spirit among you. As you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, may the communion of God's Holy Spirit rest upon you today and forevermore. Amen.